Hello again. This is Dr. Steve Klein from the Department of Communication at the University of Missouri. Welcome to another online video lesson intended to provide you important principles and helpful concepts in the study of communication. This is the last in a three-part series of videos that looks at some simple but fundamentally powerful models of communication, all of which developed during communication research and theory development in the middle part of the 20th century and can be really useful for explaining how different types of human communication actually operate. This video is going to be focusing on the transactional model of communication, but in order to best understand it, I think it's probably going to be helpful to briefly review the first two models so that we can get a good understanding of the distinctions between them, as well as the similar elements that they all share. In particular, the interactional model and the transactional model can occasionally be confused because there's aspects of them that are really similar. So we want to make sure we can compare and contrast them easily. Let's get started. The first of the three models is Shannon and Weaver's 1949 transmission model of communication. This understanding of communication is one that assumes a unilateral asymmetric information flow of communication. In other words, it's unilateral because the flow of communication is just one way from the source to the receiver. It's asymmetric in the sense that the source of the communication is the primary mover and shaker here. The source is the primary responsible party in what gets communicated and how it gets communicated, with the receiver essentially assumed to have a more passive role. And finally, Shannon and Weaver understood this as information flow. Essentially, it is just the transmission of predetermined content in a message from one point to another point. Pretty simple and straightforward. But then we started considering the interactional model of communication. It retains a lot of the same elements of the transmission model in that we've got sources with messages, channels, getting sent to receivers who are decoding the message. But it also brings in some other important elements with regard to what receivers do in communication as well as the surrounding context. I think it's going to be important to take another look at how the interactional model operates, albeit briefly, so that we can have a better understanding of how it's similar to, but very different from, the transactional model that we really want to focus on. The following is a text message exchange between a couple that met on the dating application Tinder, and you might actually recognize this as a pretty popular meme a few years back. This mobile phone screenshot is from the perspective of the person who is trying to get to know Megan a little better. So first, uh, the original source of the message sends the pickup line. Hey, want to exchange numbers and just text memes back and forth until we find each other so funny that we actually decide to hang out? Megan responds, that's the best opening message I've ever had on Tinder. Blushing smiley face. Our hero responds, I'm proud my life has come to the point where I attract women with memes. And Megan responds with, my Canadian number is, and then presumably provides the number, so that digits in hand, our hero is going to be able to start a dating relationship with Megan. Okay, so how can we explain how this works through the interactional model? We have a source of communication and a receiver of communication. Our hero texts the opening pickup line, which essentially is the encoding of a message, and that message gets sent through a particular channel. In this case, the channel is SMS text communication. Megan receives the text, decodes the message, tries to determine what it means, and then has a response, encodes that response. That's the best opening message I've ever had on Tinder. And so now Megan as receiver becomes Megan the source and then sends this text message through the SMS channel back to our hero who now becomes a receiver of this message, decoding Megan's response and figuring out what it means and then responding back. I'm proud my life has come to the point where I attract women with memes. And this message is encoded. It's sent through the channel to Megan, who decodes it, and ultimately then encodes a response. Here's my phone number. So two things are really important in this model. First of all, we have the sense that we have a bilateral and symmetric approach to understanding communication. It's not just the speaker sending everything one way and primarily being in charge, but both parties to the communication are going to alternate turns as source and receiver of messages through a turn-taking process. 
This back and forth, I take a turn, then you take a turn, then I take a turn, circular process is one really important part of this model, improving over the transmission model. The other piece of it, of course, is that all of this communication takes place within a context. They're not going to be able to understand what each other means. Uh, Megan is not going to get his joke, find it funny and cute, unless they share some cultural and social understandings about such things as what memes are, why people find memes funny, how does Tinder operate, and how do people sometimes use memes on Tinder? What's the importance of having a sense of humor when it comes to whether or not somebody might be a potentially interesting romantic partner? and so forth. So we have bilateral communication in which both parties have symmetric or equal roles to the communication, acting as sources and receivers by taking turns, and all of this is an exchange of meaning within particular contexts. Now, this sounds pretty good, but the transactional model is gonna go a bit further. The transactional model was developed by Dean Barland, a scholar who wrote up this theory in 1970. And what Barland was especially interested in was communication theory that was going to be more relevant for interpersonal communication, the kind of communication that takes place in face-to-face -face conversations, for instance. And so when he develops his theory of the transactional model, it looks something like this. And, uh, well... Ah, that's really complicated. Okay, so this version of Borland's transactional model is one that you can save for graduate school. Let me try to break it down for you in a way that's a little bit more accessible. So imagine a face-to-face -face conversation. And this face-to-face -face conversation has two participants. And each of these participants are communicators. We're not going to understand them just as a source or as a receiver taking turns, because what's different about the transactional model of communication is that you've got this communication, this process of encoding and decoding messages that are taking place at the same time. Even if they're taking turns, one person saying something and then the other person is saying something, there's still communication that's happening at the same time. If you're speaking to me, then I might be providing nonverbal communication right back at you, my facial expressions, my nodding, um, and then you're going to be doing that at the same time. So it's important to think about this transaction as something that's taking place in a simultaneous moment. And so both parties are encoding and decoding messages at the same time. And according to Borland's model, there are three sets of cues that are really important to help us understand what's going on when we're doing this encoding and decoding stuff. The first is what he referred to as public cues. These are the kinds of elements in the surrounding context. Uh, and again, just like in the interactional model, we can think about the cues of context as things such as the surrounding physical environment, for instance, um, the kinds of things that are going on in the surrounding situation or the occasion. Why is it that we came together to converse in the first place? All of these things that are out there as part of the public context are going to be informed how we encode our messages and how we decode the messages from the person we're having the conversation with. But it's not just these things that are part of the public context that are important. The second set of cues, according to Borland, are private cues. These are things that take place in what we referred to in the earlier model as the psychological context. When I'm having a conversation with you and you're having a conversation with me, both of us have a sense in our own minds about who we are and what we mean and what we're trying to communicate. And we also have a sense of the other person. So I've got a sense in my mind of who you are and what you're bringing to the table. And you have your own sense in your mind of who I am and what I'm bringing to the table in this conversation. And so those private cues are another aspect of the context that's going to inform how I say things to you and how I make sense of the things that you're saying to me and vice versa. And again, remember, all of this is happening at the same time. 
And then of course, from a communication standpoint, perhaps the most important of the three sets of cues are behavioral cues. This is what we might think of more fundamentally as the communication that is happening between us. So we can think about verbal cues, the things that we're actually saying, our use of words, and we can also think about nonverbal behaviors. So the tone of our voice, our use of eye contact, our use of facial expressions and other approaches to nonverbal behavior. So public cues, private cues, and behavioral cues are all the various elements of the context and the communication tools that enable us to have this simultaneous two-way communication. Now, that's not where this model stops, because according to Borland and folks developing this model after him, the transactional model isn't just about communicating and exchanging our ideas. But what's really important about the transaction of communication is we're engaged in what folks looking at this theory often refer to as a co-creation of meaning. So it's not just that I have something I want you to understand and I send it to you and then you have something you want me to understand and you send it to me. Instead, what we're doing throughout this process is actually working together to create a meaning that we're actually going to end up sharing uh, over the course of this communication act. And so while we're doing this co-creating of our meaning, uh, this co-creation is going to be both informed by and subsequently is going to influence a variety of important levels of context. So the co-creation of meaning is going to be informed by a physical and a psychological context, uh, the surrounding environment and occasion and the ways in which we're thinking about it. But it's also going to be informed by a cultural context. Who do we understand ourselves in terms of a shared identity? Uh, those aspects of culture that we have in common, as well as those aspects of culture that may differ between us, that are going to influence the way that we interpret and the way that we encode our communication that we're trying to share. The co-creation of meaning is also going to be informed by a relational context. Who am I with regard to you and vice versa? What kind of relationship do we have? What sort of past history do we have? And how is this communication that we're currently having together, how is that going to influence the nature of this relationship by the time we're finished? Because then this relational context is going to inform the next conversation that we have. And finally, this co-creation of meaning is going to be informed by a social context. So not just our individual relationship, but who we are within the context of a larger set of social norms and social constructs. Who are we in terms of where we live and what sort of socioeconomic status we might have, what other kinds of social factors might influence the way that we look at each other and we look at the things that we're talking about. So each of these context areas is going to have a huge impact on the way in which we make mutual sense of what we mean and at the same time, the ways in which we are co-creating certain meanings through our communication is going to influence the way in which we understand these contexts. The psychological context, the cultural context, our relationship, um, the social context within which we're living our lives, all of these things in a very real sense are going to be transformed by the communication that we have. Okay, so when we look at the transactional model, we can see some important similarities and differences with the interactional model. First, it's bilateral communication. It's two-way, just like the interactional model, except that instead of taking turns, this is communication that is simultaneous. We're both communicating at the same time. This is a symmetric communication, like the interactional model, in which both parties to the communication have equally important roles. And this communication is not an exchange of individual meanings taking turns, but it's a co-creation of meaning. We're working together in this communication act within certain contexts, and we're doing communication that is also transformative of these contexts at the same time. So in a real quick nutshell summary, here's the three models of communication that we're trying to learn about today. First, we have the transmission model, which is a simple, one-way, unilateral, asymmetric flow of information from point A to point B. Think about mass media from an electronic or written print source. 
Then we have the interactional model. This is circular two-way exchange where the parties to the communication take turns being the source and the receiver of a message. So think about the relationship between a public speaker and an audience or think about the parties to communication over text messages. And finally, we have the transactional model of communication, where we have two communicators that are working together to construct meaning all at the same time. Our verbal and our nonverbal communication never stops. And all of this conversation is taking place within various contexts that are going to be transformed by the communication that we're actually doing within those contexts. Okay, so if you have any questions at all about these three models of communication, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.